Hi everybody, today we're going to do the class 2 amalgam on tooth number 19 and I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California and today we're going to use the Acadental Typodont. This is the Model Pro 1 and it's a great Typodont. I thought it would be nice to do a prep on this tooth. So let's talk about the burrs that we would use. We have a burr block at our center that we use for everything from ceramic veneers to all ceramic crowns, inlays and onlays, direct restorations of all different types including composite preparations and amalgams. This is the third evolution of the burr block and right there is a 330 RGS which is a terrific burr for refining your class 2 preparations and I think that after you see this burr in action today you'll be very interested in using that in the future. The burr block has finishing burrs for composites, it has shaping burrs of different uh, configurations, and the back row has got mostly diamonds for indirect preps from full gold crowns, PFMs, all ceramic, inlays, onlays, it's got an end cutting burr, it even has a burr in the far right that would be used for bevels on gold inlays and onlays. So I think the block pretty much has everything that you'll need for any prep that you could be faced with. So why don't we get started with the preparation and I think it's kind of nice to trace the outline form. The Acadental tooth is a little bit different than the Columbia and the Kilgore tooth but the main thing we want to remember is that the preparation follows the primary grooves and not the secondary grooves. And if you note in my outlining right here I am following the primary grooves with one exception and that is the distal lingual area, how it fishtails downward. That's actually a secondary groove and we're not going to want to include that. You can see here that I'm outlining the box approximately where it will be located so that we get 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters of proximal clearance. And I like to really visualize this and see that I'm getting the exit angles making a 90 degree angle with the unprepared outer tooth structure. And I think it's really helpful to do this. You can also draw in the S-curves and we're going to talk a little bit about S-curves a little bit later on in the video, exactly how I approach them and uh, how they uh, can be made more easily. So you can see that the S-curve will curve around the triangular ridge on the mesial buckle and blend into the box where the box itself is not going to change its shape at all as a result of the addition of the S-curve. The preparation is going to be started utilizing a 330 burr and will follow these primary grooves and will move from mesial to distal. Of course we are going to omit that little tail moving off towards the distal lingual. So let's start with the first burr which would be the 330. The 330 of course is 1.6 millimeters in length. You could just uh, consider it to be the ideal depth cutting burr that we would have in operative dentistry. And we like to start a punch cut here in the mesial box area. In the event that we might go a little bit deeper than ideal, we know that our box will be in this location and we're not going to inadvertently cause a problem with the pulpal wall being too deep in one area, for example, if you started in the middle of the preparation. We're then going to take the burr from this punch cut, holding it perpendicular to the occlusal table. And the occlusal table, of course, is going to be the cuss tips and not tip the burr buccally or lingually and that oftentimes happens with this tooth because uh, we forget the fact that it is leaning in lingually following the curve of Wilson and it will require us to tip our handpiece a little bit towards the lingual in order to be perpendicular to the occlusal table at all times. I like to start with just a little slit that goes down the middle of the tooth following the primary groove maybe make an assessment how we're doing and then just make small brush strokes keeping the burr at full depth the whole time and extending down the primary groove. And I'm not trying to make anything particularly smooth at this point I'm just trying to get this initial depth and uh, configuration and the shape established. At this point you can now uh, make sure that you're doing okay with respect to following the primary grooves and make any alterations you may need to make and then extend the burr approximately a millimeter into these secondary grooves that you see going off towards the distal buckle right here 
I'd go the full uh, width of the burr into that area and then the full width of the burr into the buckle groove and then we're going to come back and do the same thing into the lingual groove thereby establishing the basic primary groove outline form of the preparation and I'm not taking any extra care at this point to make the transitions smooth as I'm going to these areas. It's a rather mechanical and uh, sort of a sharp transition from the isthmus area to these little extensions. We're going to smooth those later when we do the S-curve. But now I think it's uh, time to move on to the box. So let's go ahead and pick up the 245 burr and drop the box. 245 burr has got a round end on it. It's relatively straight. It's supposed to be slightly pear-shaped, but it really is barely pear-shaped. And we're going to use this and probably move the entire burr to the depth of the flutes into the box area. You're almost always safe doing that. You can get an idea of what the type of requires and make these uh, alterations as necessary. We're going to converge the facial wall of the box and we're going to make the lingual wall of the box perpendicular to the gingival so that the opening of the box is convergent but it's convergent because of the convergency of the buckle and not because of the convergency of the lingual because the lingual is in fact going to be perpendicular and that's going to follow the, the morphology of the tooth uh, interproximally. See how we're straight here and then we're tipping in over here. When you do the box it's good to move the burr straight as you can so you can make a nice flat gingival but also go a little bit deeper axially and the reason for going a little bit deeper axially like we're doing here is to give yourself access to using hand instruments later on in the procedure. You don't want to have the box so narrow that you can't get a hatchet in there easily or you try to cram a hatchet down into the box and you end up scratching the adjacent tooth which I'm sure we've all done if we're too conservative with the box. So we'll continue now with the hatchet and this is the 10714 because the hatchet can fit. There's a little bit of a problem with the axial wall but you can see that the hatchet essentially will fit at this point and then we can just chip out this little this little piece. I like to call this the Sturdivant chip although I'm sure that Dr. Sturdivant uh, would be uh, probably embarrassed that I called it that but it was done uh, so nicely in his textbook and demonstrated there uh, so for many years I've always thought this is something that Dr. Sturdivant uh, had thought of, but I'm quite certain that it was uh, invented many, many years before that. But uh, we'll use that little chip technique to knock out this lingual portion and buckle portion and gingival portion of the, the box area to try to get some clearance with the adjacent tooth and do it in such a way that we don't scratch the adjacent tooth. Even though we're nowhere near being fully extended proximally, I always like to have the discipline of keeping the hand instrument 90 degrees to the cable surface at all times. That way I know that no matter when I stop, I'm always going to have the right exit angle. Yes, I might be a little bit overextended or underextended, but at least my exit angle will be correct. And I think that that's an important habit to get into. So we're going to use the burr again to further extend. And this is... Uh, really kind of an undermining and chipping technique. We're purposely creating a little C-shape or a little bird beak there on the lingual that we can then go back in with the hatchet and chip that area away. This makes it uh, easy to extend your box without hitting the adjacent tooth, which is a challenge for every dentist in doing conservative class 2 preparations. How do we break contact and yet not hit the adjacent tooth. I think that on type on teeth it's actually harder than it is in the mouth because the enamel tends to chip away a little bit more naturally but with these homogeneous teeth we need to make these big chips. Now watch how we use the hand instrument with the long end of the instrument up against the wall at all times keeping the bevel away from the wall chipping downward to uh, break clear of tooth number 20. And it takes a little bit of patience, as this is probably the, the most tedious part of the procedure, but the one that uh, will pay us dividends if we take our time and, and do, it, do it in this particular manner. So you see we're getting much closer to getting the appropriate extension. At this point, when you have the box 
pretty much roughed out, uh, you think you've got it where you want it, let's go ahead and uh, maybe use the hand instrument to do some refining and smooth off some of the uh, walls, but uh, also try to get the axial wall in a more convex shape. And that can be done by pushing the secondary cutting edge of the 10714 distally so that you're able to scrape away the axial wall in those areas near the buckle and the lingual. See, this is a distal push of the instrument. We're not really pushing down so much as we're pushing distally. I think that this is a, a very important trick to, to, to learn because it can give you that nice, even gingival width as you go from buckle to lingual. So that's what we're showing you here. And uh, we can take the end of the uh, chisel also to remove any little bumps or irregularities that we might see. So we've spent a little bit of time making the box a little nicer, but really uh, it's not done because if you look at the lingual clearance, it's not nearly enough. So we're going to assess this with uh, an RGS-1, which is a 0.4 millimeter wide instrument, and it's not even close to uh, clearing. So uh, what do you think we have to do here? Well, of course, we're going to undermine and chip again. So we're going to use the 245 burr and we're just going to feather it down this lingual wall, keeping it away from tooth number 20. You know, notice how we're really not uh, getting the burr very close at the initial part. And then we'll just slowly move the burr over towards number 20, getting very close to it to make that little C shape so small that we can easily chip it away. So once again, we pick up a very sharp 10714 enamel hatchet and we push down on that little thing. Rather than twisting the instrument this way, we want to have the instrument angled always at 90 degrees and we practice that discipline of achieving extension while maintaining the proper exit angle at all times. And you can see how we're pushing it down with the proper uh, angulation of the hand instrument. Now, having done this, you can see that you created some irregularities. There's irregularities along the gingival, and the axial wall is now looking worse than it was a few minutes ago. So uh, that's okay. We're mainly concerned about getting the proper extensions. So we knew we could do it before, we so can do it again. So why don't we use the handpiece as much as possible and be efficient? Uh, I like to quote my mentor, Dr. Warren Johnson, who always said, use the hand piece to define the preparation and use your hand instruments to refine the preparation. So we don't want to spend an enormous amount of time with hand instrumentation when the burr can do it so much more efficiently and better for that matter. It makes for a smoother wall. So once you've got this box to the point where it's uh, the proper dimensions, you may spend a little bit of time refining the gingival refining the, the exit angles if you have any small areas that might have undermined enamel. And then we can assess this again with the RGS instrument. Once again, 0.4 millimeters just fits. And then look down at the gingival, you can see that it's approximately 0.5 millimeters. Of all the extensions, the gingival could be the one that's more than 0.5 and you wouldn't have any trouble. This is an RGS-3 and we can look at the axial depth or gingival width, mesial distally, and see that it's more than one millimeter, which is great. And this is the RGS-4, which is 1.5 millimeters. And you can see that the depth is less than the RGS. So we're right in that 1.2 to 1.4 millimeter range. So we're in pretty good shape. Now the preparation really only needs one more step, and that is refinement in fabricating the S-curves. This is the 330 RGS. And the burr is not intended to start your preparation. Uh, some students that have been using this are trying to use it to cut the entire prep, but it just doesn't work. It's mainly for refining. And you can see that this is the 245, and the 330 RGS is 2 millimeters in length versus 3 millimeters, and it has a much flatter bottom to it. And here's the 330 regular versus the 330 RGS. You can see that the 330 RGS has a flat bottom to it. It's convergent. It has that little blue stripe on it, so you can really... Uh, remember which which burr it is. I'm going to bring up my iPad here and I'm going to do a little sketching. So I've taken a photograph of the prep at this stage and I'm going to show you how I would handle the S-curve. So in green here I'm outlining the exit angle on the facial and then the exit angle on the lingual. And then I'm going to draw in the 90 degrees you can see here on the facial side and then we have 90 degrees here on the lingual side. 
Now I'm going to go ahead and sketch in the axial curvature and interestingly the preparation should also have 90 degrees internally on both sides as well and this is possible because of the curvature of the axial wall which is yet to be refined. You can see this is the triangular ridge on the mesial facial and the triangular ridge on the mesial lingual and right down the middle of the triangular ridge on both of these uh, on the mesial facial and mesial lingual side we can mark a little red dot and that will be the end point of the S-curve. The S-curve continues into the cusp approximately a tenth of a millimeter and then makes a nice sweep into that little red area. A tenth of a millimeter straight in and then it follows that sweep around that direction towards the middle of the triangular ridge. So that's the S-curve or the reverse S that we've all learned to love. And then we're going to take the burr also and we're going to look at these sharp edges that we've established by doing this somewhat mechanical preparation that we did on the rest of the prep and we're going to smooth those off as well. So anything you see that's a sharp edge around the rest of the preparation, the 330 RGS will very nicely round off these little sharp areas. So we'll just take these little areas here on the distal part of the prep. Any transition will then be smoothed. And we do this at this stage because the burr is ideally formulated for this particular purpose while giving you a very nice flat pulpal wall rather than a pulpal wall that has a dip down the middle like you would have with the 330 standard burr. And then of course when the S-curve is done, the surface area of the pulpal part of the preparation increases. The box stays the same. So here we are with the 330 RGS and we're just going to start by just slightly rounding it off. Don't try to get the whole S-curve at once, but just sort of slowly work your way into it and stop and assess your progress as much as you need to. And you can get a feel for this burr. It, it, it doesn't cut aggressively like the 330 burr does. It's a very minimally cutting burr. It does it in a very controlled manner. It maintains your convergency so nicely. You can never do this with a 55 burr. 55 burr is going to destroy your convergency and the 55 burr, if held convergent, is going to destroy your pulpal. This burr allows you to get both the pulpal wall flat and the remaining walls remaining in a convergent shape as you're finishing the preparation. So it's pretty sweet for that particular purpose. The burr was made longer than 330 on purpose so that it could smooth the entire wall, not just the minimal 1.5 millimeter areas, but all areas of the preparation. As you can see at this point we're getting close, but really the transition from the occlusal to the box, it's not done yet. That's too aggressive of a transition. Now it's much smoother and nicer. We're using now the, the hatchet to make any little refinements in the line angles and point angles. This would be the time when you could put in retention if you wanted to put, place a auxiliary retentive form in there and you can also use a very sharp instrument now just to very lightly to uh, make these corrections. This is a gingival margin trimmer, it's a mesial, and we're going to place the axial pulpal bevel by starting in the middle of the wall, buccal lingually, and pushing it towards the lingual, pushing it, almost twisting the instrument. This is how this instrument should be used and not dragged. So when we're going to make the bevel on the other direction, we're going to start we're not going to drag it like this. We're going to take it in the middle and we're going to push it this direction in order to get the accurate axiopulpal bevel that we uh, need to have, which would probably be about 0.3 millimeters in width if you were to measure it. Uh, for those who like to place gingival bevels, uh, although I don't think they're always required as long as your exit angles are uh, strong and you have no ena undermined enamel, you can use the same instrument for that purpose. Once again, starting in the middle and rotating it over towards the uh, lingual wall and it works really nicely for that as well. So the preparation is uh, nearly complete. Uh, perhaps it's not a perfect preparation. I don't think that that's uh, uh, always possible but it's certainly our, our goal. We want to try to be but it uh, doesn't always happen. But I think that it's adequate. This is the RGS1 that's showing you the 1.5 millimeter minimum depth, not maximum, not average, but minimum depth and the 0.4 to 0.5 millimeter uh, clearance that we have there. 
This is the RGS3, which is one millimeter in width, and you're, we're seeing a one millimeter wide isthmus with a one millimeter extension up the uh, secondary grooves on the buckle, the two on the buckle, and then the one on the lingual. It's nice to be able to measure that. And notice here that you have no adjacent tooth damage whatsoever by following the techniques that I've outlined in this very short and hopefully really helpful video. It was great to spend a few minutes with you. I hope this was helpful. Uh, give me feedback. Always here to help. All the best. And of course, all the instruments, the Typonaut, the hatchets, the burrs are all available from StevensonDentalSolutions.com for speedy delivery.